If, uh, if you're new or visiting here at the church, I'm Slade Reinhardt, the youth ministry director here. Our lead pastor, Todd Malone, is either on his way or already in Indianapolis for a uh, Gospel Coalition conference, so I'm pinch, pinch hitting for him this morning. We are uh, right in the middle, uh, well actually toward the end, of a sermon series on Sunday mornings called The Upper Room. <clears throat> which began in John 13 in the, in the upper room where Jesus shared the Last Supper with his apostles. And today's message, as you just heard Lauren read, is from John 17, 1 through 5. So if you haven't already turned there in your Bibles, go ahead and do that. Alexander the Great, the legendary military leader, was born the son of Philip, king of Macedonia, which was uh, in Greece. When he was 18 years old, his father gave him command of a small army and sent him on a, a, uh, first, the first of many military expeditions that he would go on. When he was only 19, his father was assassinated and the military leaders and the nobles of Macedonia proclaimed him to be the new king. And Alexander then quickly began working to unite the Greek city-states under his leadership after which he embarked on a military campaign against the Persian Empire. Now, as you know, he was stunningly successful in his military exploits. Over the next uh, 12 years or so, he expanded the Macedonian Empire to be one of the largest that history had ever known. By the age of 30, he had conquered much of the ancient world, uh, much of the known world at that time, uh, with his empire spreading from Greece all the way to India. Alexander had a thirst for glory. Alexander wanted to be known as the greatest, the best, the most powerful. He longed for the praise and adoration of all the peoples of the world. As a matter of fact, he considered himself to be divine. He uh, believed himself to be a descendant of the Greek hero Achilles. There is a uh, story told by the ancient writer Plutarch that uh, Alexander in his studies as a young man, uh, after he had become king but still in his 20s, learned that uh, philosophers believed that there were an infinite number of worlds. And Alexander began weeping, and his friends asked him why he was crying. And he said, is it not worthy of tears that there are an infinite number of worlds, and we are not yet lords of even one? He had this thirst for glory. He wanted to, to, to conquer the world. You want to hear something strange? Jesus also had a thirst for glory. Now, that sounds a little bit weird to us because we usually associate that phrase with with pride and egotism and, and selfish ambition but of course jesus was the greatest example of humility that ever walked on the earth so how could a thirst for glory coexist with a humble heart that's a good question <laughs> hopefully i've written an answer <laughs> the solution the solution to this problem comes from understanding the kind of glory that Jesus wanted, as well as his motivation for seeking it. Now, Jesus was not seeking the temporary self-serving glory that Alexander was seeking. He was not seeking the kind of glory that uh, many celebrities and, and uh, many of the rich and famous seek. He wasn't trying to boost his ego. He wasn't trying to validate his existence. He wasn't trying to soothe his insecurities. He had something much greater in mind which we'll see once we get into today's passage. To help get you oriented, uh, remember that for the last several chapters, Jesus has been talking to his disciples and preparing them for what was just about to happen. Because in just a few hours, he's going to be betrayed by Judas Iscariot. He's going to be arrested. He's going to undergo several trials <clears throat> before the Jewish leaders, before Pilate, before Herod. He's going to undergo torture and beating and eventually, of course, he will undergo the crucifixion itself. And so Jesus begins preparing them for this time that he is going to be taken away from them. Now, as you know, he is going to return to them for a little while. After his resurrection, he'll spend 40 days with them. But then after that, he was going to ascend to heaven. And the apostles would never again on this, in this life uh, experience his physical presence. So Jesus was giving them all this information to prepare them to be able to manage and to adjust and to carry on after all these things that happen. Now, as we saw throughout the past several chapters and throughout this series, by and large, the apostles didn't really understand 
what he was getting at. They often misunderstood this idea of him going away and coming back again and going away. But he had given them, at this point, he'd given them enough information that they had the, the, uh, the knowledge in their minds to be able to comprehend and put it all together once the events unfolded. So now Jesus pauses and he turns to prayer. This prayer takes up all of chapter 17. It's often known as the high priestly prayer because uh, in this prayer, Jesus intercedes for his followers as, as the high priest of Israel would do. But surprisingly, the prayer begins with Jesus praying for himself and not for his followers. There are four truths that I want to highlight in this passage. The first one is this. Jesus wants to be glorified to glorify the Father. Look at verse 1 again. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. He begins this prayer with the phrase, the hour has come. What hour is he talking about? In John 12, 23, just a few days before, he had said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then in John 12, 27 and 28, he said this to his apostles, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then in John 13, 1, he made it crystal clear. He said, now before the feast of the Passover, this is John writing, not Jesus, excuse me. Now before the feast of the, feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. So this hour that Jesus is praying about right now is talking about this final few days of his life, this, these momentous events that are about to unfold where he is going to undergo what I mentioned earlier, the betrayal, the arrest, the torture, the suffering, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. The hour has come. The time is now. Therefore, Jesus prays, Father, glorify your son. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we usually associate a thirst for glory with vanity and pride and selfishness. But Jesus said, glorify your son in order that the Son may glorify you. He wanted to be glorified in order to give glory to the Father. His primary motivation for his glory was the glory of the Father. Now, before I go any further, I do want to talk for just a bit about the meaning of this word glory. What does glory even mean? The word means honor or splendor or the quality of remarkable appearance. And therefore, to glorify means to honor or to exalt or to bring positive attention to. So when Jesus prays for the Father to glorify him, he is praying to be honored. He is praying for positive attention to be brought to himself. And then he's saying, and he will honor and give positive attention to the Father through that. Several years ago, I ran across uh, this interesting thought that C.S. Lewis developed. He uh, wrote a book called Reflections on the Psalms, and here he wrote this. When I first began to draw near to belief in God, and even for some time after it had been given to me, I found a stumbling block in the demand so clamorously made by all religious people that we should praise God. Still more in the suggestion that God himself demanded it. We all despise the man who demands continued assurance of his own virtue, intelligence, or delightfulness. We despise still more the crowd of people around every dictator, every millionaire, every celebrity who gratify that demand. So Lewis tack tackles this head on, thinking about, okay, why is God always asking for and even demanding us to glorify him? It sounds self-serving. In fact, at one point he said it sounded to him like an old woman constantly that you compliment her. And I'm not talking about anybody in this congregation. <laughs> that was C.S. Lewis's words. Uh, so Lewis, as he thought this through, he resolved this stumbling block with two realizations. First of all, he realized this, that it is in the process of being worshipped that God communicates his presence to us. It isn't the only way, but it is one of the ways. When we are praising God, we are also experiencing his presence. In the book of Psalms, God says at one point, I inhabit the praises of my people. And that's the idea that, that C.S. Lewis is getting at here, that when we praise God, that is God, uh, God then manifests his presence to us. And the second thing he realized was that praise not only expresses, but completes our delight or enjoyment. 
We very naturally praise what we enjoy. We praise what brings pleasure. We praise what satisfies us. You don't have to go very far to uh, find a sports fan who is willing to praise his favorite team. Because he delights in them, he enjoys them, he's proud of them, and so it is natural to therefore give them praise. So <clears throat> what C.S. Lewis realized that when we praise God, we are completing or filling out our enjoyment of God, our in God, our appreciation of God. God's desire for us to glorify him is a blessing to us. It isn't something that he needs. It is a blessing for us. Now, with regard to God, there are two kinds of glory. There is intrinsic glory and ascribed glory. And I will say this, this whole uh, sermon is not going to be a lecture, lecture, so just stick with me. God's intrinsic glory is the glory that he has by his very nature. It is the sum total of who he is, his greatness, his splendor, his holiness, his infinite power, his boundless intelligence, his omnipresence. That is God's intrinsic glory. And in that with respect to intrinsic glory, that's not something we can give to God. It's something he has by virtue of who he is. God has always been and always will be glorious. God always has been and always will be great and awesome. But in addition to this intrinsic glory, there is the idea in Scripture of ascribed glory. And this is the praise and the honor that we give to him. It refers to the honor or glory we give in response to his revelation of himself. So in verse 1, when Jesus is saying, Father, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, that is the kind of glory that he's talking about, ascribed glory. Whenever you are uh, realize who God is and what he has done and how awesome he is, you then ascribe glory to him. And so Jesus is saying, the hour has come, the time has come, I'm about to suffer and undergo what I have to undergo for the redemption of mankind. And in and through that suffering, I am asking you, Father, to exalt me in the eyes of men and women that I may receive their ascribed glory, that I may receive honor from them. <clears throat> Glorify your son in his patient endurance of suffering, in his selfless sacrifice for the sins of man. And the primary motivation for Christ's desire for glory is the glory of the Father. You've probably heard people say that God always works for his glory and our good. And that is true. If you are a child of God, then the Bible says that he works all things for your good. And at the same time, God is always working for his glory. These two truths go hand in hand because our highest good is experiencing and enjoying and seeing God's glory. There can be no doubt that Jesus went through his suffering and his crucifixion for our good, our salvation. He did that because he loves us. But it is also true that the root motivation for what he underwent was to bring glory to the Father. It isn't the same as an agent in Hollywood uh, doing what he can to glorify his client. <clears throat> Listen to this explanation from Sam Storms, pastor of Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City. Far from being sinful and megalomania, I can't say that word, sinful, selfish megalomania, we'll go with that. For Jesus to pray in this way, this is the way that he loves us. So again, it is, God, it is not Jesus saying, I need your praise. It is not Jesus saying, I need your validation. This is the way that Jesus loves us by calling on us to glorify him. Storms goes on. He says, for in pursuing and demonstrating and imparting their glory to us, talking about the Trinity, they are giving us the greatest gift in all the universe and in this way are loving us in the highest degree possible. For God to pursue his glory and for God to love you passionately are not separable or distinct, distinct pursuits. They are one and the same. Jesus had a thirst for glory motivated by his desire to glorify the Father. And that pursuit of God's glory is for our greatest good and blessing. It was not earthly glory that Jesus was desiring. It was not the praise of men that he was after for his good looks or for his strength or for his... Uh, I can't speak this morning. His courageous actions. He was wanting the glory that comes from righteousness, the glory that comes from sacrifice, the glory that comes from displaying his humility and his love. Jesus wanted to be glorified to glorify the Father. The second truth I want to highlight is this. 
Jesus and the Father are glorified in giving eternal life. Look again at verses 2 and 3. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus and the Father are glorified in giving eternal life. So after Jesus asked the Father, glorify me so that I can glorify you, he follows up with more specifics about what that means. He says that he will glorify the Father since or because the Father has given him authority over all flesh or all humanity. And that authority gives him the right to give eternal life. Now, I'm not going to take the time to riff on this for long, but notice who receives eternal life from Jesus. All those whom the Father has given him. That means that every believer is a gift from the Father to the Son. Jesus said something similar in John 6, 37. All that the Father has given me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. If you have put your faith in Christ, which is what he means by coming to him, then you were given to Christ by the Father. You are a love gift from the Father to the Son. Now be careful about turning that around. Don't get the idea that before you come to Jesus, you need to know if the Father gave you to him. The only way that you know that you, the Father gave you to the Son is by trusting in Christ. And what you have trusted in Christ, you can Rejoice and revel in the truth that you are a gift from the Father to the Son. Now back to the point at hand. Jesus is glorified in giving eternal life because it is an act of grace. Eternal life is earned by no one. No one deserves what God gives to us. It is purely out of his loving grace that he gives us eternal life. And that glorifies Jesus. We magnify, we love, we appreciate Jesus because he did that out of his grace. Because he did what we did not deserve. <clears throat> Positive attention is brought to him. He is glorified in giving eternal life to undeserving sinners like you and me. And the Father is glorified... When Jesus gives eternal life, because the Father gave the Son that authority. And it is the Father who gave us, who receive eternal life, to the Son. So giving eternal life displays the grace of the Father as well. And in addition to being glorified by the display of grace and generosity and love, the Father and Son are glorified because of the very nature of eternal life. Jesus defines it this way in verse 3. This is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The only true God. Deuteronomy 6, 4, the great Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is only one true God in all of the universe. And Jesus said, It is knowing him that is eternal life. This is the goal of the faith. This is the end of the faith. The goal of your faith is not the forgiveness of sins. That is a means to an end. Your sins had to be forgiven in order for you to be brought into union and communion with God. But union and communion with God is the end. That is the goal. That is the highest good that you can experience in the universe. Knowing God, that is the goal of salvation. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3.8, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And God is glorified in being known because that means he is being revealed. And when God is revealed, what do you see? You see beauty. You see greatness. You see omnipotence. You see omniscience. You see his glory. You see his splendor by faith now and one day by sight. Jesus gives the knowledge of God, to, uh, of the Father and himself to all those who believe in him. And that brings honor and praise to God. Because it reveals his character. Not only are Jesus and the Father glorified in giving eternal life. But Jesus and the Father are glorified in the work of redemption. Look again at verse 4. Jesus speaking to the Father. I glorified you on earth. Having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Now right after praying. Father glorify the Son. That I may glorify you. Jesus said I have already glorified you. By accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. What is the work that the father gave the son to do? Luke 19.10. 
puts it wonderfully. Son of man came to seek and save that which is lost. 1 Timothy 1, my eyes, 15. 1 Timothy 1, 15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The work that the Father gave the Son to do, the task, the mission was this, the work of redemption, redeeming, buying back lost men and women to be part of his family forever. He came to save us. He came to rescue us. Now, think for a second about the timing of this prayer. At this point, Jesus just said, I've accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Was the work all done at this point? No, the work was not all done. He had not yet been betrayed and arrested, tried, tortured, and crucified. The suffering and the crucifixion are still in front of him. It was on the cross, as you know, that right before he gave up his spirit to the Father, that he said, finally and in the present, it is finished. But here he's praying and he said, I've already accomplished it. In fact, the word accomplished there, same word that he uses on the cross for finished. It is finished. So how can he say right now, before he's walked the road to Golgotha, that he's accomplished the work that the Father gave him to do? He can say that because he is 100% certain of it. He knows without the least doubt that he will obey the Father as he has always obeyed the Father all the way to death on the cross. He knows that just as he has perfectly fulfilled his task so far, he will perfectly fulfill it to the end. That's why he can say he's accomplished his work. He's looking forward and saying, it's as good as done. Because I am going through with it. I am going to obey the Father all the way to the end. I am going to accomplish the work of redemption. Theologian Michael Horton says this about Jesus. For the first time, the world has an Adam and Israel has a king who will do only what he hears the father say. Jesus, in contrast to Adam, in contrast to every king of Israel, Jesus was perfectly obedient to the father. He delighted to do the father's will. And that's why he had this assurance that he would finish the work. And that assurance was so strong that he could talk as if it was already done. Well, how is Jesus glorified in the work of redemption? By virtue of being the one who accomplished the work of redemption, obviously, he's glorified by displaying his humility. He left the glory of heaven to be incarnated as a human man, to live among us, to experience all of us sinful people living around him, to experience the in inconveniences and pains of living in a fallen sin-filled world he allowed himself to be arrested and tried and tortured and killed when he could have destroyed those roman soldiers with a thought but he willingly went through it because of his great love for us and because of his desire for the father's glory he knew that he was going to he was certain that he would accomplish the work of redemption he's glorified by displaying his obedience Remember in the Garden of Eden, which happens just a little while after this passage, the Garden of Eden, wrong garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, call back to the first book of the Bible there, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, he started feeling very sorrowful, he was stepped away from the rest of the apostles with his inner circle, and then he stepped away from them, and what did he pray, Father, if it is possible let this cup pass from me. So it, humanly, he was feeling the dread and the pain of what he was about to go through. But what did he keep saying? Father, not my will, but yours be done. So he knew he was going to follow through. He knew he was going to obey. He was absolutely certain that he would submit and obey all the way to the point of death on the cross. And the Father is glorified in the work of redemption because he is the one who sent the Son to do this. Now I realize that sounds a little bit secondhand, which I guess in a sense it is secondhand, but uh, here's an illustration that might help. In 1904, American citizen Ion Perdicaris, who was living in Morocco at the time, was captured by a well known Moroccan outlaw. Teddy Roosevelt was president at this time, and when he heard about it, he dispatched several warships to Morocco and demanded that the Moroccan government secure the release. Of the, uh, of the citizen, uh, Perdicarus. The, uh, the outlaw's name, by the way, was something like Raislius. And so the message that he conveyed to the Moroccans was, we want Perdicarus alive or Raislius dead. Your choice. So the, uh, the Moroccan government did. They gave in to that demands and they were able to secure his release. Now, the people on those warships, 
They were the ones who were immediately involved in getting Perdicarus free. So there was glory or honor that they would have received for that. But Teddy Roosevelt is the one who sent them. And so he could also be said to be responsible for setting them free. So in the same way, even though it is Jesus who is doing the work physically of redemption, he's the one who became incarnate. He's the one who suffered and died on the cross. But because the Father sent him, the Father receives glory for that as well because it was also the Father's motivation and love and desire to redeem us. The Father's love for fallen humanity was, was of such a great quality that he sent his son to redeem us, or to put it even better, I can't put it better, of course, than John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The father and son are glorified in the work of redemption. Okay, the last truth that I want to share with you from this passage is this. Jesus and the father share eternal glory. Verse 5, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So now Jesus looks further ahead. He looks past all this that he's about to experience. He looks forward to the time when he would ascend into heaven and uh, be restored to his rightful place on the throne of the universe being worshipped uh, constantly by the angels, the seraphim, and the cherubim, and receive, once again, the eternal glory that is his by nature. He's not praying at this point for the glory of humility or sacrifice or accomplishment. What he's praying for is a return to that intrinsic glory that he shared with the Father and Spirit throughout all eternity. Before time began, before anything other than God existed, what we call eternity past, because in our minds, we can't conceive of something before time. God was existing in perfect joy, in perfect harmony, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perfect contentment, and displaying His glory, the glory of infinite power, the glory of infinite wisdom, the glory of infinite presence, the glory of holiness, untainted, of righteousness, beautiful and pure. The three persons of the Trinity shared that eternal glory. And Jesus was praying, Father, bring me to that day when I'm going to share that once again. When no longer will his glory be veiled in that human flesh. When no longer would he be willingly submitting the exercise of his powers to the Father and the Spirit. Bring me to that time when I will share again that eternal glory with you. God's eternal glory is what Moses wanted to see in Exodus 33. He asked God, show me your glory. But the unveiled glory of God is more than a human body can take. God said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. So God put him in a cleft of a rock and said, I will make my glory pass by, but I will cover you with my hand. And after I'm passed by, the way he put it anthropomorphically was, you will see my back and not my face. In other words, you're not going to see the full sight of my glory. You're going to see the afterglow of my glory after I've gone through, or otherwise you would be incinerated. The brightness that remained <clears throat> was what Moses saw. This is the brightness and the splendor of God that he has possessed forever. And this is what Jesus was looking forward to sharing once again. No longer keeping his glory shine, uh, veiled, he could shine in his fullness. When the apostle John saw Jesus many years later after he had ascended, when Jesus came to him to reveal to him the book of Revelation, he described in this way. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From, a ma from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. How many of you ever stared at the sun? Don't do that. It's a bad idea. <laughs> 
We've all done that at one time or another as kids, right? And John's saying, that's the closest thing I can compare this to. It's like trying to stare directly into the sun because here is Jesus glorified. Here is Jesus displaying his intrinsic, eternal glory. And John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now, even John, of course, did not get the full brunt of his glory. Or again, he would have, he would have died immediately. But John saw a glimpse of the eternal glory of Christ. Now, before I wrap this up, some of you may have been wondering, where is the Holy Spirit in all this? Because as you will notice, all through this section, he keeps talking about the Son and the Father, the Son and the Father, the Son and the Father. Why all the focus on the Son and the Father? Why is, isn't the Holy Spirit co-equal with the Father and the Son? Don't we believe in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit? Yes, if you guys are wondering, yes, we do. Uh, we do believe in that. The Holy Spirit is undeniably co-equal with the Father and the Son. Very God of very God, as the old creed says. Then this being, Yahweh, this one true God, he exists eternally as three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Each of the persons is equally and fully divine. But in the great work of redemption, which is where we are encountering God, of course, in the great work of redemption... The Spirit has humbled himself to take a background role in the, the revelation of God. And so what he does, the Spirit says, and Jesus said he would do this. The Spirit is always pointing to Jesus, giving glory to Jesus. And Jesus is constantly pointing at the Father, giving glory to the Father. So the Spirit has, for the time being, taken a humble and background role. And that's why we often don't see him in the Scriptures. Because the Spirit actually is the one inspiring those Scriptures. And he is glorifying the Father and the Son. Uh, the analogy that, that I've heard given before, it's like uh, the reason that moms often aren't in family pictures. Because they're the ones holding the camera. Okay, the Spirit is holding the camera here on the Father and the Son. So that's why we don't see him at the moment. But the Spirit shares that eternal glory with the Father and the Son. So here's what I believe is the point of this passage. Jesus desires and deserves glory for himself and for the Father. As the divine Son of God, Jesus is innately glorious. From eternity past, he has shared divine glory with the Father and the Spirit. Because of his perfections, because of his excellencies, he deserves glory. He deserves praise and adoration. But on top of that, he chose to be the vehicle the actor in the great drama of redemption, the one who would humble himself to become a man, walk on this earth for 30 years, live a perfect life, and then allow himself to suffer and die to pay the penalty for our sins. So in addition to his innate glory that he deserves just by virtue of who he is, he has earned glory by virtue of what he has done. Jesus is worthy of double glory. Great and awesome, eternal, and the one who sacrificed himself to bring us into relationship with him. And Jesus desires that glory. He wants us to see him as glorious. He wants us to magnify his name. He wants us to honor his character. He wants us to praise his achievement. Not because he needs it. Were no man on earth to say Jesus is worthy, the Father has said it. Jesus needs no one else to validate him. But Jesus knows that that is our greatest good. That is our highest and greatest experience. To know, to see, to appreciate his glory. It is because we need it that he says that he wants to be glorified. I've come up with a few ways to respond to this passage. These great truths that the, the Lord has presented to us. Let me give you just a few. First of all, praise Jesus for what he has done to deserve glory. Glorify Jesus with your words and your thoughts by praising him for what he's done. Jesus suffered and died to propitiate the wrath of God against you. He did that for you, not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, because of his love for you. Jesus bought you with his blood. Jesus rose from the dead. He purchased your forgiveness. He purchased your adoption into God's family. Praise him for that. Give him the glory that he desires as it will fulfill and complete your enjoyment of God. As it will be an experience of you in his presence. Give him the glory that he deserves. 
Secondly, consider how you can glorify the Lord throughout the week. It is easy, thankfully, it is easy on Sunday mornings to give God glory when you're surrounded by hundreds of other people who are doing the same thing. It is easy to sing praises to God when you have a group of musicians up here leading you to sing praises to God. The challenge is giving glory in your everyday life. How can you glorify the Lord at your job? How can you glorify the Lord at school? How can you glorify the Lord when you're suffering or overwhelmed or depressed? How can you glorify the Lord when you've had a hard day and you've just finished supper and your eight-year-old son will not stop asking you questions? How can you glorify God in those moments? That is our challenge. So I challenge you to consider that. Consider ways that you can glorify him in the everyday. First Corinthians, he said, whether you eat or you drink, do all for the glory of God. So use a napkin. No, just kidding. Anyway, uh, I can glorify God at my job by being patient with my irritating coworker, for instance. So when he asks for help, I'm not saying I have any irritating coworkers. <laughs> That's not, that's not what this is about. I'm not. My office borders Jordan Johnson's office, and we have our door open. And I probably bother him more than he bothers me. So uh, I'm not talking about any of my coworkers. So what you could do is decide, okay, Lord, the next time my coworker asks me for help, I'm not going to make up some excuse to say no. I am going to help him with a good attitude for your sake. Not for your co-workers' sake, for the Lord's sake. Because I will glorify the Lord by saying, Well, Lord, you're more important than my irritation. You're more important than my inconvenience. And so I'm going to lift you up in this person's eyes. Finally, confess anything in your life that hinders you from glorifying God. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you have been made new. You've been given the Spirit of God to dwell in you forever. And in, in your innermost being, you want to glorify God. If you are a believer, you want to glorify God. That's just part of who you are now. And one of the works of the Spirit is to expose sin in your life that hinders you from glorifying God. Sin in your life that is in opposition to God's glory. So pray and ask the Lord, is there a habit is there a relationship? Is there an attitude that is hindering you from glorifying God in some aspect of your life? If there is, if you discover that, confess that to him. Receive his forgiveness because he promises forgiveness and ask for his strength to remove that hindrance. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, the great Son of God, I come to you and I praise you for this glimpse into the prayer life of Jesus. I praise you for the, the intimate truths that you have revealed here. I praise you for showing us your glory yet again. I praise you for what Jesus has done for us. And Lord, I pray that you would minister by your spirit in the hearts of every man, woman, and child in here. And draw them closer to you to see your glory, to appreciate your glory, to enjoy your glory. Lord, if there's anyone in this building that does not know you, I pray that your spirit would show them their sin. And show them that Christ is a sufficient savior to save them from your, their sin. He is ready to draw them into his family, into full forgiveness and life. God, I pray that for any believers that are struggling right now, that are feeling the despair or the pain of trial or tribulation, that you would this morning turn their eyes to behold your glory. Not to forget about what they're going through, not to pretend that it doesn't matter, but to set their heart to rejoice in your glory. Thank you again for your word, Lord. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your great love for us. In your holy name I pray. Amen. If everyone would please stand and uh, prayer team, you can come on up. Good job being here. There are a group of uh, men and women up here that are uh, here after every service that are, that are here willing to pray with you, excited and eager to do so. If there's anything you're facing, 
a problem, a difficulty, pain you're going through. If you want to know more about Jesus, talk to one of these people and they would be joyful to share that with you, to pray with you, to encourage you, to stand with you in prayer. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for your attention and your attendance in God's house. I pray for God's richest blessings on each and every one of you. You are dismissed.